Greetings, lifelong learners of New York State and beyond. I'm happy to welcome you to today's virtual field trip at the New York State Museum. I'm Dr. Jeremy Kirkman. I'm an ornithologist and the curator of birds here at the State Museum. My job here is um, a mix of research and teaching and curating the state's bird collection, which is upstairs above us on the third floor where my office and lab are. It's an old collection. It's as old as this museum is, and we're one of the oldest North American natural history museums and the oldest state museum in the country. So we began collecting birds and other kinds of specimens in the 1830s when Governor Marcy instituted the original geological and biological surveys of the state to assess our natural resources. And all the specimens that were gathered as part of those original surveys came back here to Albany where they were stored and displayed for the education of the citizens. And so the original state zoologist was James Decay. And since James Decay handed the baton to the next guy, there's been a long stream of generation after generation of ornithologists and curators taking care of that specimen collection, adding to it with their own research specimens, also adopting abandoned collections along the way, and doing that to fulfill the State Museum's mission to generate new knowledge and to share it with the citizens to, um, how do they say it in there? They say that it's to explore and express the diversity of things that, that occur here in the state. So that's what I do here. And uh, in terms of the, the teaching that I do, um, one of the best teaching tools that we have is to do exhibits from time to time. And so I'm standing here in our Hall of Birds. We call it Bird Hall. It, it's a, the home of our permanent exhibit, the Birds of New York. And this has been one of my major teaching projects for the last few years to do a complete renovation and reinterpretation of this, of this exhibit gallery. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the renovation project and give you a chance to see the newly renovated habitat dioramas of, uh, with mounted birds. And then we'll take a little walk around and take a look at some of the other habitat groups. And I'll invite questions along the way. And behind the camera is my friend Catherine Weller. She's our director of museum ed, and we're keeping an appropriate distance from one another. And she'll uh, relay questions that you might have to me as we go through the, the tour today. So uh, what I'm standing in now is one of five habitat groups. This is called Evergreen Forests. These two dioramas have mounted birds. And the birds that are mounted in this hall number about 170 specimens total. So that's really only about 1% of our collection that I curate. So we have over 20,000 cataloged objects upstairs and less than 200 of them are on display here. It's typical of most natural history museums. And so when I started my job here almost 15 years ago, uh, the, the hall had been here in place since this building was built. This building was one of the last phases of the giant construction project for the Empire State Plaza. And so the building opened to the public in 1976. Before that, the bird collection had various homes, including for almost a century in our state ed building on Washington Ave, a couple of other homes before those days. But when this building opened up, this exhibit opened up. And so all the birds that were mounted for display were mounted by taxidermists that worked for the State Museum in 1974 and 1975. And their idea was to give the visitors a snapshot view of all the major bird habitats that occur throughout the state. And if you're like me and you're interested in birds, New York is a marvelous place to live because we have coasts and tidal marshes down by Long Island and New York City, and we have alpine grasslands above the tree line in the high peaks of the Adirondacks and everything in between. So we go from sea level to more than 5,500 feet of elevation and also lots of habitats in between, including freshwater marshes, deciduous forests, shrublands, and things like that. And so these different habitat groups that we're going to get to see as we walk around represent the major kinds of habitats that you encounter as you go to different places throughout the state and uh, we're, we're starting our tour here in evergreen forests. So if you look at this map, uh, this is a map of the elevation in the state, and the evergreen forests are really only found above 1,000 meters of elevation. And so areas in the Adirondacks 
and in the Catskills and in the Taconic Mountains and in some places in the Appalachian Plateau. Those are the places where you'll find evergreen forests dominated by spruce and fir trees and that is a unique bird community. So the birds that are exhibited in these two habitat dioramas are birds that you would have to hike uphill to see unless they were passing through your backyard during the spring or fall migration. Let me show you some pictures to talk a little bit about how this project proceeded. So you can see that it's a very nice shade of green. There's a lot of nice lighting. We've endeavored to put some new things on the side panels here to teach you some things. This is what it looked like before the renovation. Let's see if we can get, I'm gonna to try to get out of the shadow. How's that? Can you see that, Catherine? So this is the, the diorama that I'm standing in front of. As you can see, there was a non-realistic background. Everything was painted beige. The background was a hideous shade of green and the labels were silk screened on the, on the bottom and in the back of the diorama, the labels for the bird specimens. And so uh, it was sort of a sickening yellow color. There wasn't, there, it didn't give you a very good sense of what this habitat was like. Here's the other one. So this is, this is what this diorama used to look like. The lighting was fluorescent tubes and it came through a sort of a plastic mesh that was yellowed because of eight years and years of fading. And so they had this sort of sick yellow hue to them. And the birds themselves also were starting to look a little bit shabby because all those years being under the fluorescent lights led many of them to become very faded. And some of the smaller birds were prepared as freeze dried specimens. And so their faces were starting to shrink and their eyes were sinking in. And so when we decided we were gonna try to renovate this whole hall, what we did is we took apart each of these dioramas took all the birds out, and if they were not in bad shape, we cleaned them up, we vacuumed their plumage, we repainted their feet and their beaks and shined up their glass eyes. And if they were really far gone, we replaced them with new taxidermy mounts. We hired a taxidermist who was able to take birds that had been salvaged by myself and by other citizens of the state, send them to him, and he would mount new specimens for us to reinstall. The background is a printed photograph Let's back up a little bit. So you can see that it's a, a giant panel of wood. And what we did is we found photographs that are of the places where these birds would live, printed them on canvas, and then mounted the canvas photograph onto the background, and then replaced the birds, repainted the decks, installed new LED lighting, um, and also uh, repainted the whole hall. Another thing that we wanted to do was try to increase the amount of information that's available to visitors. So if, if you want to just look at the birds, you can come and look at the birds. This hall has always been a favorite from kids in strollers to really old people. It's a nice peaceful place. Every age group loves the, the hall of birds when they come visit the New York State Museum. And so if that's all you want to do is see birds up close, you can do that. But if you're interested in digging a little bit deeper, we wanted to provide some uh, deeper information about these habitats, about conservation issues, and also some things about the evolution and ecology of birds. So as we walk around, I'll point out some of those things. Here's another thing I wanted to show you. This is when we started to get into the design. Um, this is what the designers would do. They would take these digital photographs and we would mark them up. These are my handwritten notes showing which birds I wanted to keep and which branches we thought we might want to replace, where we might want to move things around because as long as you've got everything taken apart, that's your chance to do all that. We did have a question about what happened to some of the birds that you could not reuse or put back into the exhibit. Some of those were discarded because they were so far gone. Most of them were given to our Department of Museum Ed that Catherine's in charge of so that they could be used as hands-on teaching tools. And a few of them I have on my cart here. So maybe I can just skip what I was gonna say next and come back to it to show you some of these birds that actually were taken out to be replaced. So this right here is a golden crowned kinglet specimen that was in this diorama right behind me. And the lighting in here is kind of hard for you to see through the phone camera, but it's a badly faded specimen. Its eyes are sinking in, its beak and its feet are, are really badly faded. And so when we removed this bird, we replaced it with those magnolia warblers there, which we had in the freezer. And I have with me here on my show and tell cart, 
a more recently collected specimen of that same species. This is a golden crowned kinglet that's from the research collection. So this is what our research collection specimens look like. They have a tag that's tied to their feet. They're laying on their backs in drawers in metal cabinets upstairs so that they don't take up much space. But if you compare these two specimens side by side like this, hopefully you can see how badly faded this one is. This is a beautiful black and white and greenish bird with a big flame orange crest that it can stand up on end to impress the females of its kind. And the and the one from 1974 is really showing his age. So that's one that we're using now as a teaching tool and also just as a historic record of what happens to birds over time if you don't keep them in the dark. We have a question about how do you collect the birds that you, that you have? The birds that are in the research collection and the ones that are in the the hall here as mounted specimens are primarily salvaged birds. They're birds that are found by a citizen's dead. That we also do maintain collecting permits and so you, I'm a scientist who has permits from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and also from the New York State DEC that allows me to collect and possess a small number of birds for research purposes. So some of the collection has been intentionally collected by ornithologists over the years in pursuit of documenting the diversity and abundance and distribution of birds throughout the state uh, for various research projects. But most of the birds, including almost all the birds that are in this hall, are birds that were salvaged, that were, that were found dead. And so we've uh, made use, you know, for example, when we took the golden crowned kinglet out, we replaced it with the magnolia warblers because that's what we had in the freezers. So rather than going out and trying to get a new golden crowned kinglet just for the sake of exhibiting it, we sort of make do with what we have in, in that case. So let's see. Oh yes, so back to the renovation project. The team that I worked with is awesome. And if they're watching at home, I wanna give a shout out to Carrie and Ford and Chris up on the third floor and Scott and his whole crew that worked down here on the first floor. It included writers and editors, um, the taxidermist that we hired, um, designers, uh, both graphic designers and interpretive designers, painters, artists, lighting and audio technicians and carpenters, all kinds of uh, talented people. It's one of the great pleasures of being a scientist here at a museum instead of being a scientist on a college campus is that I get to interact with uh, teachers that teach young kids and older kids and also all these different talented people with these eclectic skills. And so we did these one at a time. We would block off this area when it was time to do evergreen forests we would take the wall off. So this giant pane of glass is in a wooden frame that is the front wall of the diorama. And so in order to get these cases open, we had to remove the front wall with, with screwdrivers. They're, it's attached in, in the corners. This whole thing comes off. It's extremely heavy because it's a huge pane of glass. And then you put that aside while you work on the inside, take all the birds out, repaint it, relight it, all that kind of stuff, put the labels back in. And then at the end, you put the front wall back on and then uh, you, you um, paint the outside of the gallery. Here's um, another set of my notes from when we were renovating this set of dioramas. This was a sort of a middle stage. We decided which birds were gonna go where at this point. And we were, I was working with the graphics designer and the interpretive designer to try to select what the different backgrounds might look like. So we would go to the internet and we would find images. We'd select the ones that we wanted to print and then we'd do the printing here. Let's see what we have next. So then the designer would give me something like this, which is, a, which is a photoshopped version of what this might look like when it's done and we could make additional notes about what, what we wanted to add or subtract and what we wanted to do with the branches and the birds. So this is the, the photograph that we selected uh, before it was actually printed at the large scale as a way for us to sort of mock this up and see what it looked like ahead of time. This is what, the, what this whole bay looked like. So you can see that the walls were dark gray. It was very dark. The, the dioramas themselves were that sort of sickening beige yellow. And the benches were these 50-year-old ugly wood, wooden benches. So the whole place has really been spruced up. In addition to just cleaning and reinstalling the birds, there's a lot of new stuff to learn. It's a much more comfortable and nice place to spend time. So let's see. I think next what I'd like to do is walk around and Catherine will follow me with the camera and 
we'll, I'll point out some things along the way, some things that we've tried to, to add and some of my new favorite elements of the exhibit. And you can continue to send questions in and I'll just answer them on the fly as we go. So this is um, one of the evolution stories that we've tried to tell using some more elements of the research collection from upstairs. So in addition to stuffed bird skins like the ones I was just showing you, we have bird skeletons upstairs. And so this is an, uh, a little story for someone to read to learn about the way, different ways that finches have evolved to specialize on different kinds of foods. And so these are two finch species that we'd find in an evergreen forest with very different bills, one of which is a specialist on extracting seeds from pine cones, this thing called red cross bill. So let's see, why don't you follow me this way and we'll go to deciduous forests. I wanna bring with me a couple of these birds to show you some other replacements. So the deciduous forests is a habitat type that's distributed throughout the state. This would have been the, by far the most dominant land use type in, um, in New York State prior to the uh, humans arriving and setting up agriculture. And so this is maybe the, the, the habitat other than your backyards that you're the most familiar with. And in this area, we had to replace a lot of the, the specimens because they were extremely badly faded. So here's um, a wood thrush that was in this diorama over here. And here is an American red start, which was in the diorama that's directly behind me. These were replaced with new, new specimens because they, like the kinglet we talked about earlier, really started to show their age pretty badly. Our new wood thrush is in here by the stump. He's that very alert looking guy right there. And you can see they're a beautiful reddish brown. They're not gray at all. So um, that's one of my favorite additions. Just to the right, Catherine, show them this nest here. This is an American woodcock specimen that has always been in this exhibit, but we've never had a nest with egg specimens exhibited as part of it. So there's uh, some new elements to look at um, in terms of just the, the specimens that are on exhibit here as well. All right, let's keep moving. Who's got questions? Uh, from Hampton Place, uh, is watching with their elementary school. All right. And we don't have a new question yet, but we'll see. Okay. So this is freshwater wetlands. This is a habitat that's very patchy and in its distribution throughout the state. A lot of large marshy wetlands occur in the Finger Lakes regions, but all up and down the Hudson Valley and into the foothills of the Catskills and Adirondacks, you'll find freshwater marshes filled with waterfowl and shorebirds and grebes and rails. Some of my favorite bird species are in this area. This is tidal bays and marshes. This is a very locally distributed habitat in New York. This is down by Long Island, Long Island Sound in the Atlantic coast. And the Hudson River is actually tidal all the way up here to Albany. So salty or brackish water uh, that moves in and out as the tides move in and out. Uh, this is a very important habitat for a lot of wintering waterfowl like these scoters over here. Even if you're a really great birder with a long life list and a very expensive pair of binoculars, you're not gonna have a chance to see a black scoter or a surf scoter up this close unless you visit us here at the museum. We have a question about how many bird specimens you have in your collections. 20,000. 20,000 bird specimens is the, is the approximate number. If you think it's something of value, you can email me or send me a phone message here at my office at the museum. Uh, if you have a photograph of it, that helps because that would, I can verify the identity of the bird. But I actually got an email just like that this morning. A citizen found on his back sidewalk a dead white-throated sparrow and wondered if I wanted it for the research collection. And as I told him, that's a very common species that passes through here this time of year in great numbers. And we have already have several of those in the freezer awaiting their time on the specimen prep table. And so I said, thanks, but no thanks to that one. But most of the time, I, it's something that we want to add to the collection because it is part of my mandate to document the birds of New York as they are today such that we can use those specimens collected today as a baseline for future studies and also to go back in time using the collection as if it was a time machine to see how bird populations and birds themselves have changed over the course of decades or centuries. So yes, we always want citizens to save it and then contact me and chances are I'll say yes, I want that. 
You'll want to stick it in the freezer in a Ziploc bag with a little note that has w your name and when and where you found it. And um, then we can come and get it from you or you can come drop it off and then it'll become part of our permanent research collection. Here's another example of uh, an avian adaptation story talking about how birds that live at the sea catch fish in different ways and how birds that live in marine environments get rid of the excess salt that are in their diets. So this is a skull of a herring gull and you can see these little carved out areas above his eyes. Those are recesses within which the nasal salt glands would have sit. So this is a way for, it's sort of like an extra set of kidneys in their head. It filters their blood takes the excess salts out and then makes them available through their nostrils so the birds can actually go and they can spit the extra salt out and get rid of that so that they don't oversalt themselves. Okay, let's keep moving. This is fields and shrublands. This is the, the, some of the birds that might be the most familiar to you. Things like cardinals and buntings and uh, American goldfinches. The, this is a habitat type that would have been rare naturally in New York prior to agriculture, but now that uh, humans have altered the landscape so much. And so this, if you look at the map, are concentrated in areas where we have the most agriculture. The grasslands are the yellow color on this map, and they're concentrated in the Hudson and Mohawk Valleys, and in the Finger Lakes regions, and in the Lake Ontario Plain. Uh, one of my favorite new elements of the hall is the addition of these interactive panels where you can listen to birds singing. Uh, this is indigo buntings, northern cardinals, and prairie warblers, all three species that you can see in the diorama behind Catherine. And these are species where the males are extremely bright and showy and sing a lot. Cardinals are singing like crazy right now in New York in my backyard. I hear them every morning. And if you push the button, you can listen to the northern cardinal. All these birds are basically saying the same thing when they're doing this. They're saying, here I am, this is my spot. And so they're advertising to the other males that this is my territory and you had better get gone, and to the females that are around that this is my territory and I'd like you to stick around. When we put this panel together, we included these diagrams that ornithologists use to analyze and study bird song. This is called a sonogram. And on this axis is the frequency. So high notes are up here and low notes are down here. That's the frequency of the wavelength of the sound. And on this axis is time in seconds. So when you push the button and you listen to the prairie warbler, you can actually follow along and count. That's that note. And then there's a period of silence. And then there's the other note. And just for fun, let's listen to the indigo bunting too. The indigo bunting is a little messier song, as you can see from the sonogram. Always notes in pairs. Come on, indigo bunting. Okay, let's keep moving. I got one last thing I want to show you. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay. And while we're moving, what is your favorite bird? My favorite bird. Everybody always asks me this, and I have I never have a really good answer. But the answer, and it changes over the years. It depends on what kind of research I'm working on. But right now, I think the answer is yellow-bellied flycatcher. So the yellow-bellied flycatcher is a cute little gentle bird that lives in the evergreen forests where we started our tour. You have to hike to very special habitats, very moist, mossy evergreen forests to find them. They're the bird that spends the least amount of time in New York State. They are the last migrant to arrive and one of the first ones to leave at the end of the summer. And uh, so getting a glimpse of one is a real special treat. And they're one of the birds that I've worked on in terms of uh, DNA research in my lab upstairs. So the uh, current answer is yellow-bellied flycatcher. Okay, so this area right here is the only area of the hall that's not a habitat group diorama. This is our chance to renovate a part of the hall that I thought was not really doing a good job teaching us about birds. It used to look like this. It was feeder birds that might visit your house in the winter and feeder birds that might visit your house in the summer. They were just these two cases. There wasn't really much to, to see or learn here. There was pigeons and starlings and house sparrows mounted here. And so what we've done here is we've basically built a new exhibit within an exhibit to talk about two very important topics in bird ecology and conservation, which is the birds that we've lost to extinction, these birds here that are under the heading gone forever, and then these birds over here 
that are behind me, which are ones that were nearly extinct, but which have been brought back from the brink of extinction by the heroic efforts of state biologists and academic ornithologists who discovered the link between agricultural pesticides, thinning eggshells, and the declines in the 1960s and 70s of peregrine falcons, bald eagles, and other large raptors. So uh, in addition to taking some of these extinct bird specimens out of storage and putting them on display, we've told the story of why these birds went extinct. For most of them, the story was over exploitation by people. We shot too many of them either for food or for sport, or in the case of the Carolina parakeet, they were hunted for their feathers because it was a fashion craze to decorate women's hats with brightly colored feathers. And so Carolina parakeets, heath hens, this guy on the end, the Eskimo curlew, they're all no more. They're gone forever. We'll never get these species back. And the only way that you can learn about them or see them in, in person is to come to a natural history museum. Over here to my right is a timeline of the extinction events that took place and how the extinction, especially of the passenger pigeon in the Carolina parakeet, spurred politicians and other uh, activists to enact new laws in the early part of the 20th century. It was too late for these species, but it, those laws have gone a long way towards protecting species and preventing future extinctions. So most of these birds went extinct prior to the advent of things like the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and um, clean air and water laws. And then finally, our last stop on the tour is the back from the brink section. So these are species that are not extinct, but they very nearly went extinct in the 1970s. And so these are other mounted specimens that we've taken out of storage and displayed for the first time. And the timeline talks about how scientists discovered the link between these agricultural pesticides and the eggshell thinning. We've got a set of eggs on display here in front of the peregrine falcon. These are peregrine falcon egg sets from the research collection that were collected in 1887, so well before the advent of of uh, industrial scale pesticide use in uh, farming. And so that was used as a baseline study to compare how the eggshells were um, in the past and how the eggshells were in the present in the 1960s. So that was originally a clutch of four eggs that was hollowed out and preserved here at the museum. And there's only three left in that set because one of them was given to the professors at Cornell, Dr. David Peacall, to measure its thickness and also use biochemistry tools to extract the DDT residues and to establish that link physically between eggshell thinning, which was the cause of these population declines, and the use of industrial pesticides. And so that's a story that you can learn about if you read this timeline and you read these extended labels for these specimens here that are now on display for the first time. We do have a question, actually two questions. Okay. What, what's our most endangered bird today and what is our most endangered um, landscape that, or that we've seen today? Okay. Um, I think that if you're talking about New York species, our most endangered bird is in our most endangered habitat. So I think that's probably Bicknell's thrush. Bicknell's thrush is one of the new specimens that we've put on exhibit. That people can come and see that. It's a really iconic bird for bird watchers to try to see because it migrates to the very highest forests in the Adirondacks and Catskills and breeds nowhere else. Um, well, nowhere else in our state. It also breeds in Vermont and New Hampshire and Maine and Nova Scotia and in parts of southern Quebec, places where there's lots of fir trees. And so this is a habitat that's endangered because global warming is tending to push habitats uphill. So the ecotone between the temperate deciduous forest below and the boreal evergreen forest above has been rising over the last 50 years. We know that's the case because long-term studies have established that. And we think that that will continue to happen as long as we continue to uh, feed uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and, and raise the temperature of the whole earth. And so these high elevation habitats are the ones that are gonna become smaller and smaller as they get pushed up to the tops of these mountains. And there's nowhere else for those birds to go because in between us and the big swath of boreal forest to the north of us in Canada is the St. Lawrence Seaway and River Valley, which is a totally different kind of habitat. And then a lot of agricultural communities in between there. And so it's not gonna be easy for the birds to just keep moving north um, or keep moving uphill. So I think that the answer is probably the, the evergreen forests at high elevations and Big Nose Thrush for for that same reason. Any other questions? There were a lot.
lot of questions. I was not able to get to all of them, <laughs> so they'll be waiting for you. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, I think my time is about up. I think I'll try to field those questions later. Uh, Catherine and Kelly Ferranic uh, will forward those to me, and I'll take some time later today or tomorrow to answer those remaining questions. Thanks for coming to the field trip today. Maybe next time uh, I'll take you behind the scenes in the research collection and labs upstairs and show you something that you wouldn't get to see if you came and visited our public areas in the museum.